Thanks for being my guinea pig for this. This, yeah. is, this is nice. This is different. <laughs> this is not. This is not something we've done before. Yeah. Um, there we go. Hey. Oh, hold on. Are you moving? Look at the camera. Do you want to look at the camera? I don't know if we have to look at no, the camera. No, I'm not going to look at the camera. Look at the camera very much. I'm just going to sit and talk. Just ignore. Just ignore, ignore the camera? Me. Yeah. I mean, in the future, what we could do is we could do a camera like on you and a camera on me. Like two cameras. Do two, two cameras. Yeah, yeah. But I don't have three cards right now. Right. And the third card is what we need to make sure that the audio is synced with this. More editing too, right? If you do no. it that way. No? Okay. No. So, because when we're, if we're not doing... <laughs> no. <laughs> no. What happens is you just... So in the timeline, when you edit that stuff... You just take both camera tracks and just lay them one over top of each other, oh, synced. Okay. Yeah. And what happens is you just click, like you watch it. You're just watching it basically. And when one of us is talking, so it'll mostly just be on me because right because you're here to to listen to me. <laughs> of course, that's, yeah. That's how every interview. That's, I was thinking with that in the car. I was like, he keeps trying to tell me about his life, but I'm so much more interesting. Is it my turn to talk again yet? Can we just can the attention be on me now? Um, <laughs> then then you just basically cut back and forth. Oh, this is gonna bother yeah, me. Tight, I should tighten that back up again. Guy, yeah. Well, because I was I I un I untightened it. I yeah. loosened it so that it would go where I wanted it to and then is it going to fall off it's going to be great if this mic falls off halfway through it's probably going to I'm, I, this is, is like exactly. sort of just doing the, the Pisa thing <laughs> we, it's we, like, realized, <laughs> we realized that every table in this place was just wrong enough for these two mics <laughs> It's a little too thin. It's, it's a, a little, little too, too thick. thick. Yeah, yeah, like somehow I managed to buy exactly the wrong thing yeah. for these two brackets but that's fine. I'm excited yeah. about it. It's working for now. Yeah. That's good enough. So man, I'm stoked you're here. I'm yeah, stoked man. you got to see the place. It's great. Uh, I'm sorry I hid the fact that I needed to rebuild this whole studio for so long. <laughs> and thank you very much for helping me move heavy things. Yeah, of so course. I didn't hurt yeah. myself any more than I've already hurt myself the last you month. Work on your second can you pass me my second hurry? Can you pass me my water? Thank you. And you can drink my coffee if you want, I guess. I don't know if you want to drink my coffee. I'm off caffeine. You're off, so. you're off yeah. caffeine? Oh, yeah, dude. How are you alive? We it's, both have two kids. I don't know how you... It's the greatest decision I've ever made. Shut up. Yeah, honestly. It's After, like, oh. was, there like a, was there like a train spotting style like... <laughs> Like, like you had to like see a baby crawl across the yeah. ceiling with its head turn around first. Cause that's what I imagine mine will be like. Mine will just be straight. It'll be an no, absolute. No, it's just the, it's just the getting old and like you, uh, you, you find, uh, new ways to try to, uh, to, to get back a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that works for me anymore. Yeah. I, don't know if I don't know if any of those hacks are left. <laughs> yeah. They might be all gone at this point. I had, to, um, I had to wait till I got deathly sick to uh, to get off caffeine. To get off caffeine. That's, that's the trick. If you ever want to stop doing something, wait till you're ill, horribly <laughs> ill, and then that's how I quit smoking. And then, honest, yeah, honestly, and then, and then you, just smoking, yeah. you just don't start again. You just don't start again. again. Yeah. yeah, I had like a lung infection for like two months when I worked for GW. You might remember this. It was like the winter time. I was traveling between all the stores. Actually, no, because you didn't work for me then. You were working for Bolger. Um, but I was traveling to go see Benoit in Montreal and I was like in that holiday inn and I didn't sleep for like three days because I couldn't sleep without coughing. Oh. I had like a lung infection where like I had to cough so hard to like get whatever was in me up that I then would like trigger more coffee. Like yeah. it was like, it was an absolute yeah. horror show. But I, I didn't smoke for like a month and a half. And of course I didn't go to the doctor. No. Right. Because no, no. like I'm living in the States and I don't want to like get charged. So no, I don't go yeah, to the doctor or anything. Um, never mind the fact that we had amazing healthcare and I probably could have just gone. Uh, and then I finally did. And they were like, yeah, you need like some serious antibiotics. You need some like horse level <laughs> antibiotics. <laughs> we're going to shoot you with yeah, antibiotics. Right. And then you also have to inhale this like four times a day. And I was like, okay. Oh, and then I just didn't he's, smoke. He's got better. Yeah. Yeah. I got it's better. Amazing. And then Kat was born and I didn't want to smoke anymore. Ah, so that's awesome. Yeah. That was it. Kids do have a strange way of motivating, motivating you into good habits. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just into like living a little bit longer yeah. so that you can see whatever stupid shit they end get up get up a little earlier you know all that sort of good stuff yeah it's funny because yeah. because when the kids are with their mom i can i will wake up at 5 30 in the morning no matter what i yeah. i'm just physically incapable of sleeping anymore i don't think i just can't do it yeah i just realized if i turned these headphones around the other way i would have an extra like six inches of, of <laughs> you're literally got yeah. on the bad side yeah, yeah. <laughs> i literally and now, and now it's perfect yeah. now i can just sit exactly the way i need to sit this is amazing what a different, what a game changer. Aren't you guys glad you're here for the first one of these? <laughs> Where we're just sitting and talking about nothing. Just about nothing. You got you you to get these this. out of the way, you know? You got to find the process. You did. Yeah. 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 You're probably, so actually everybody watching is probably wondering why I wanted to actually sit and talk with you today. Um, but for those of you who don't know Chris, Chris is actually, I could do, I'll probably do an intro to this, yeah. like where I'll actually say all this stuff again. Makes sense. But the fact that you are a game store owner, you've been working in the tabletop industry for... 
Jeez, what did I hire you? Getting, eight, oh eight? We're getting close oh, to nine? 20 years. Yeah. It was 08 or 09, yeah. so at least 15 years. Yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah. Or January 08, I think. Was January 08, I'm pretty sure is when I hired yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Is when I hired you. Yeah. Um, and then abandoned you immediately to Rico. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so, and that's a story for another time. <laughs> but, um, but you've been basically uh, running your own game store that you own since. 15. Ash was born. Yeah, that's right. Eight years. Literally his son. The day. Yeah. And uh, on a snowstorm. Yeah, that was the first we day. You came to your opening. Yeah, you that's actually right. came and then you had a baby later. That night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> About four o'clock in the morning um, as we were trapped in the hospital because the blizzard had closed all the roads. That's right. And we that's were right. allowed to leave yeah. the hospital just in case she went back into labor. Yeah. And then she delivered like overnight. And uh, Ash yeah. Was- Cash is exactly the same age as your store. It was an amazing day because, uh, uh, you know, having having worked in games workshops and stuff, you, you never really know when you open a store who's going to show up to your first right. day. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, the fact that it's a snowstorm and then you have all these people come out and support you, it's uh, it, it kind of validates all that hard work. And you're like, okay, this, well, could be, this could be real. What was funny was you had all the coolest shit at the time. You had stuff nobody else had. And I think that's an interesting thing point because it's something i was really interested in talking about today is how how the game store post pandemic landscape is going and what it looks yeah. like and like where we're at because it feels like we're in a very different world today than we were even five years ago um and this is an interesting summer because this is the summer of a 40k launch and you've been through the last three in right. eight years you were your first year open was was eighth edition and, yeah. and that was that was probably the biggest 40k launch I can think of. I can't think of a bigger 40k launch than that. And I've been through fourth through seventh working for Games Workshop, and then Eighth Edition came out like well, the year the year after I left. And and just you know from an economic standpoint, you know obviously I care about those things as a hobby store owner. Sure. Uh, just the fact that we had uh, you know uh, people like yourself coming in and buying like uh, every index, and yeah. you know, we we had the opportunities to make money. Were, were vastly uh, larger at that point for that release. Like, yeah, sometimes from customers don't think about that sort of thing. But yeah, when when you have um, a lot of items to sell on a launch versus um, just like a box, right? Sure. Like, so it can it can make quite a difference. Yeah. So so what like but like explain what you mean with that? Like what? So it's eighth edition to tenth edition. That that release was for a lot of people like eighth edition. It was one of those times where they completely rewrote the game. Yeah, I think you can draw a lot of connections between the two. Like, yeah. I, I don't think they're dissimilar. Um, but but really, I think 8th edition uh, was much more massive just because, like, you had from 3rd edition to 7th, you had essentially the same engine driving mm-hmm. the car right, oh, yeah. the whole way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and you were finally saying goodbye to that to a large extent. Sure. Or at least people thought that because they were rebuilding the stat lines, uh, the way vehicles yeah. worked. It was it seemed like such a massive difference, right? I think once people actually like played 40K, they realized it wasn't it was still that game. Sure. Um in in in, in most ways, just maybe a, a, like the way you, the little odds and ends were different. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, like for, when when you're blowing everything up and starting from scratch like uh you you had the the core books, you had the the starter box sets. You had uh, an index for every army you could purchase. Um, the, the, yeah, just the amount of opportunities to make to make sales off that it was 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 massive. Right? I'll be honest, your store looked different back then too. It, it you did, had it you did. had a lot of games workshop product in your store. Yeah, and the way that you were stocking, I think when you opened, it was still like the module range. They so like their best sellers. Yeah, there was like uh, top one hundred like items basically that everybody was buying that you had access to, and then you had your paint rack, and then what else? What, what was like? What was what did the what did the wall look like back then? Jeez, yeah, I mean like uh, that's, to me that's a major difference. Like what's I, what's in your store is if that's if that's changed, uh, I'd be curious to hear what the difference is overall. I'm sorry, I'm just well, I often I right often now. joke that like uh, we couldn't open the store we opened today like back what does that mean yeah like if we were to try and open just watching open our business again today like if we did it with the same amount of money the same resources i don't think i don't think we would have made it and what i mean by that is like the amount of product we could put on the wall back then was nothing um compared to what we've collected over the like the last nine years like okay you know i think we started with about like twenty five thousand bucks on the wall like just all across the paint kits right Glue, supplies, supplies all that stuff like and uh you know you look back at the old pictures it's you're like wow the walls are barren you know it, it sure it sure, yeah, it sure yeah. felt like that you know we went pretty much all in on games workshop obviously because uh, that's what we knew you know with my, my history and stuff like that but um 
Yeah, the, the, the way the market's changed, um, I, f I definitely feel like we can get more into this, but I definitely feel like you ha as a game store, you have to have way more stuff now um, as an option to people. Okay, like just um, like variety of product or just yeah. like stuff in general? More, more kits, uh, of, even from the same games, um, like ha you have to have like a, a great variety. Um, if, you d if you don't have like, let's say all the kits for all the factions, I feel like that hurts you. Um, compared to like, you know, the competition is just so, it's so stiff now, right? There's mm -hmm. so many places that have everything, right? Um, so I think that's the standard now is like, if you, if you walk into a shop and you don't see pretty much everything, well, there's a place 10 minutes away, they'll have it. So, um, I definitely feel like that's the case. And then just from a standpoint of making yourself unique. And I think we may talk about that as a whole different subject, but sure. like finding your own way and how to mark your own brand as a shop. Um, building out the products to kind of like give yourself that kind of identity, right? So I don't know that we had an identity when we opened other than if you know us, you, you know, come, come and see come us, see us yeah, basically. Yeah. I think we were kind of riding a little heavily on that. It did, it did what I thought it was going to Oh, be. no, yes, we were, okay. we're anticipating this. It's That's okay. okay. Yeah. That's okay. We're, gonna, we're just going to move it over here now. I'm going to open it up. I'm sure this will be fine. Yeah, I can't hear it at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the audience is loving. Yeah how this is going for the first time. Uh, let's just try it like that. And then I won't touch this it. This is like inside the actor studio style. This is exactly, you, you, get, you get everything. You I, know? Like, like, I like to, I like to, I like to gorilla, to gorilla everything in the game. <laughs> <laughs> it's all gorilla recording. It's in the name. Including, it's in the name. <laughs> it's on brand. It's on brand. There we go. Yeah. I've actually found the best spot for it now. I feel like this is actually where it should have been the whole time. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be it's a work slowly leaning towards you. <laughs> it doesn't everybody. seem to be slowly falling off. Yeah, I'm into it. Okay, let's just keep it like that for a minute. But yeah, like sort, sort of having that like, you know, um, you know, riding heavily off your yourself and the sure. people you yeah, know yeah. to get to get going um versus like uh, now actually having necessarily like an, more of an identity people like word of mouth people right. on the internet know oh that's the that's like the hobby place that's the place where people go to get painting advice right. airbrushing um we've, we've worked very hard to cater that but the 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 real dollar value of that is is massive right like the investments in products and, and flushing that out like people don't necessarily know when they come in when they see like a little I don't know, no area, like uh, less than three by three area of like airbrushes and supplies, you know, that's, that's, that could be $15,000 Oh wow! just to have on the shelf just in to, capital, just sitting just there. Just in right? capital. Yeah. Like, and that's not in like what your potential for sale is. That's no. what it cost you to get cost it, me get to, get it there, yeah. to you yeah. on the wall yeah. and, and in front of a customer who, yeah. who may or may not buy it. And, and, you know, brushes sometimes can be worse too. Like fancy, fancy Kalinsky brushes Oh yeah. take up so little space. But yeah, yeah. thousands and thousands if of dollars the just, just knew, sitting there. Yeah, exactly. Right. If the shop was only there's a are, reason why they're like right across the from me. <laughs> cards. Yeah, this is this is the Pokemon cards, right? Yeah, this is right. what you want to try and grab. Yeah. So no, uh, and 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 I think that 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 kind of like those two times, like eighth edition and tenth edition, are are definitely different times in our store's history, um, where you know, back then in eighth edition. Number one is like, I feel like that launch had a lot more products to sell off the bat, but we also needed it a lot more too, mm -hmm. um, because we just didn't have the same like product depth that we have now as well Sure. in terms of hobby supplies and so, other, other things. So this is the question I was interested in asking mm. you because I have my opinions about this stuff, but one of the things I want to be able to like showcase is like the, the experience from outside of me. Like what's, what's the beat from the street sort of, if yeah, you, if you yeah. will, right? Like what's, what is the anecdotal stuff that people are witnessing and what's the empirical stuff that we can actually like quantify and prove? Um, so like, for instance, if you take that eighth edition launch, I, here's an interesting question I've been wondering is what was the purchasing and you know, I don't, I don't want to hear numbers on like that, but like, what was the activity after for you that summer? Like eighth edition launches June, whatever it's the usual like release pattern for a big box game launch from Games Workshop. You've just opened your store. It's very exciting. The year before you had AOS, you had the first edition yeah. of AOS. Like your year you opened was an AO it was AOS launch year. You guys jumped right on board with that. Had a huge summer. So yeah. you're going up against the summer of first edition AOS with 40k with a brand new 40k. Mm -hmm. What was that like in eighth? Like what was that summer like after that that product launched? I I felt like. Um still in, in in terms of my my relationship uh with the games workshop business model and trade and i i still felt very like i would say optimistic when i was making my purchasing decisions and uh i was a bit more um adventurous i would say okay um so that would lead me to for example my my mindset on a, on a launch uh for for like a box set like the new 40k for eighth edition um i would i would be i would be thinking how many can i sell 
Right. Um, and I would be maybe take my pre-orders that I could get, like you know. And, and when you're doing pre-orders, you're you're not necessarily getting all the hard cash, but you're more you're making lists of like uh, who who I think will buy, you know, that sort of thing. You know, and, and then like this, this yeah, thing's coming out. How basically, many, how yeah. many people play this army? How many people are going to be excited about and this then, thing? How many should I get? And then you're trying to add like okay, plus how many boxes? You know, mm. how many do I want to be left with, or how many like what based on my what, the, what are the optimism? Get, what do I feel yeah. like? Um, how's the business? Like all the things are going. What do I feel like I can sell? And then you know keep selling or whatever. And I feel like at that time in the business, um, I was still oh we should get lots more. And, right. You know, and, and we were reaching for to have we were not. reaching for yeah, more yeah. numbers. Okay. Um, you know, we were getting like the forty, the fifty boxes, um, because like we yeah, it just felt like you could sell them all. Sure. Um, and uh, that's I would say uh, over the co- past couple of years that that attitude has definitely shifted for sure. Why is that? So what do you like? Yeah. So so eighth edition comes out, you were like stack me up with all the different armies, all the different indexes, like, and, and, and what, like, before we kind of move on to what's changed, mm-hmm. like, what was that summer like for 40 K? I mean, I remember you guys ran events. You guys had yeah. like, you had a tournament you're running at the 40 K classic. There was a whole lot of like, like energy. And yeah, absolutely. People we purchasing stuff over the course of that summer. Yeah. And, and, and I think there was a good follow up. Um, after the box came out, there was stuff coming out after they sure. had like a real sort of like flow. I think that's right. always important. The, the connection between the next release uh, heresy last year i think did that really well right is they had their box come out and then there was you know every couple of weeks there was something and, yeah, yeah. and that it felt, it felt like a plan yeah there's a, and, plan, there's and, a plan for like as things come out and that's some, that's supported. something it almost doesn't even matter what it is really like mm. um i think it's just really vitally important for us hobby shops because it just has that peaked interest that continues um and it's a it, it kind of gets people coming back and saying oh you know this is going on. This is happening. Yeah. Um, and when there's nothing um, for a little while, you can lose that energy really quickly. Right. Because people are like ha- doing the have a go part, right? They're, they're building and painting. They're collecting the next thing. They're getting that like, they're getting that like, um, that cycle completed of like build, paint, play. Yeah. And I think that what's cool is it, it felt like, at least in my experience, that Games Workshop really had their finger on the pulse of how long that took and how often yes. you should like release the next thing. Like, yeah. are is their customer base like ready for the next thing from this product line? And I think you're right. I think Heresy felt really good because we had what we had the Heresy box game, yeah. and that was such a good design box game. You could play right out of the box. You could split it in half and have two armies, or you could do it as like one two thousand point army. Yeah. Like it was such a well designed like thought out box. And it wasn't alone on launch day. That was the other cool thing. And, and that's right. And it you came had a few out with extra like things. the Rhino box. That's the, right. Some the of the special Rhino. weapons came out. Yeah. Well, that and that was it. Is it came with things that augmented what came in that box. Yeah. yeah. And then over the course of the next couple months, you had more of that. You had the next dreadnought come out. You had another vehicle come out, and it was all in plastic, and it was all like stuff that added to the experience of the thing you just. One hundred percent. I th- and I think like anytime there's a new starter box and it's full of like awesome new miniatures, like you're you're creating this like spark in people, right? Mm-hmm. And I think the danger that you always have is if the time lapse between the box comes out and like the next army release or some kits come out. That there's always that danger that spark can go out, <laughs> right, with people, and then the the Levi- and, and and it's it's interesting because like not only does maybe that Leviathan box not get like worked on very much because there's nothing really after it quick enough, but uh, um, now that person is just was kind of like maybe not painting any of that at all now, right? So like they've kind of had a bit mm-hmm. of a drop off in their mm-hmm. hobby a little bit, uh, and and I think well, it feels like it feels like it used to in eighth edition, at least there was even like a holding back a little bit of certain things like a codex would come out, but they wouldn't release every miniature that was going to be new in that codex for like a month afterwards. Yeah. Like, and then like the codex would come out, then like two weeks later, the first box sets would come out and then two weeks later, like they, they almost like there was like a metronome of like, we meet it out so that you're, you're not, you're not, not driving people back mm-hmm. to the shop or you're not, not driving people back to their hobby basically yeah. on like a certain amount of time. And it's almost like a, remember me, you know what exactly, I mean? Like, a, like right? it puts yeah. your hand up. It's yeah. like, remember me, remember yeah. this hobby you had and also enjoy what you just got. Yeah. Like, it, well, that's it was the thing, a healthy right? Yeah. Sort of like 100%. Cycle. I think they've experimented obviously over the years with different sure. patterns of this. Um, it goes back, you know, we, we used to remember the, you know, one, we had a uh, little one thing every Saturday or whatever back sure, in the day. Yeah. Then they experimented with the once a month, I think, release yep. date. It was one, one, uh, big, one, one big, big drop. drop. Um, and then they've moved into little things where like they took like the Space Marine launch. And I think this might have been the case in 8th edition. 
um, where they they kind of like sprinkled it out over the course of a month. Sure. Um, and yeah, I think to, to your point, I think you do get a little bit of that. I can actually enjoy. What does that do for you as a store owner? Like, what do your customers say to you? How do your customers act? Because they're not going to come in and be like, they're not going to just tell you what's the psychology of your customers right. are to you every time they walk in, but you're going to see patterns. Well, exactly. Them. And I, I, of course, I always have to differentiate what people tell me and what they, yeah, do, what they do are very different, right? So, Absolutely. 100%. <laughs> so, so what I hear a lot is people, obviously people want their toys now, right? So like sure. people are like, oh, I have to wait, you know, a couple months, like the book's out, but I want this kid. I'm like, when am I getting it? It's yeah. like, so I'm, I'm hearing that, but what I see when the opposite happens uh, and let's use this Tyranid launch that's coming up this weekend or whatever is a great is a great thing. Um, pe- because there's like 10 kits and the book being like, a, it's it's a ton of stuff just being dumped on one Saturday. P- you know, most people, I don't want to like, uh, especially anybody out, don't have all the cash for that to buy all those things sure. at the same it, it time. Go. Yeah, yeah, it's a big so, ask. You might think you're getting what you want, but what you're really getting is like, yeah, the stuff's all out but, and you can pick and choose. But at the end of the day, um, most customers are, are kind of like picking and choosing what they're buying. Mm-hmm. And then they're deferring other things down the, down the, down the road. So as a store, um, it, it definitely makes my job a lot harder to kind of choose the numbers of things that I need to bring in. Right. So I, I think that's the biggest change from a couple of years ago to now is my job managing my inventory and my stock has gotten about 10 times harder. Do you get a lot of guidance? Like, like, like on, I know on average, most hobby products come through a distributor, which means mm-hmm. you're not getting a lot of guidance on them anyway, because yeah. the distributor doesn't know what everything is and there's a million different products. Games Workshop used to give a lot of guidance on on you know what to bring in and why and, and how to stock it. I'm just curious what the guidance is like now. Yeah, I, th- I think it, compared to 8th edition. I think if you're you're probably um, newer to the products, there's there's pro- you're probably feeling like you're getting a lot of help. But Good. Uh, and and I, they do keep a lot of advanced metrics, and they can tell you based on your sales, you should probably order this much. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're doing all the kind of like tough work and like measuring your own stuff and having a good feed on your community, no one's going to have a better gauge, gauge of that than you are. Than you are sure. Right. No, so, so yeah. at the end of the day, so yeah, it, it should definitely like, you know, I have a great, uh, uh, trade person that I, that I've had a good relationship with for years and we talk those things out, but God, yeah, yeah. at the end of the day, like sometimes their advice and what I, what well, I'm like, so I'm just like, yeah. no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that sounds great. But you know, yeah. that's not where my store is. Today. Yeah. I'm not, like, I'm not there. Cool. And they're like, Oh, okay, that's fine. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's so it's at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a customer, right? So I'm picking and choosing what I want. So, so, so I'm curious then. So what, what, what typically would happen back in eighth is I would go to your store and I'd be able to grab anything I wanted. Mm-hmm. And if you, if you didn't have it, I could get it. What's it like today compared to, compared to back in eighth edition or that, that period that like, you know, four or five, six years ago period. Wow. The, the, I, I feel like it's like two different businesses. Like, um, number one, um, there's probably 20% of the items, give or take that are just out of stock all the time. Like, okay. Um, so, so like the whole process of like, uh, a customer wants X item and you, you know, typically two, two to, th- oh, so let's say pre pandemic, let's just use that as the, the gauge timeline Sure, yeah, yeah. pre pandemic, um, customer wanted X item. Okay. I, I ordered on Mondays. I can have it on Tuesday. Basically it was, it was that simple. Right. So, sure, yeah. so, um, that, that relationship was really good. Um, customers could easily come in and feel like they could get the, that great quick turnaround on their products or whatever. Um, Today, the way it works is I'm most of the time telling people it's out of stock and I don't know when it's coming back. Wow. And, you know, you, you, you do your best to kind of like take their information. You know, I, I, I have the best thing I can do um, because um, they don't have any measurables for this. Like a lot of the time, the people working there don't know when it's coming back either. The best thing I can do is like I basically click the alert me button on the on the website to try to find when that product gets restocked and then try to order it as quickly as possible. Um, but I think in the reality of what that situation's created is the customer now has, it's not, I don't want to say less faith in, in their local hobby shop to get them the things they need, but there's definitely more incentive to like look, shop around, look around right, look online, and, and, and also check online yeah. yourself. And yeah. when it comes in stock, snap, snap it up, it grab up. it yourself. And, and you know, I, I don't, I have no ill will. I don't blame people for that. But there is like the casualty is obviously you know we miss out on those opportunities, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, and it, and it 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 shakes a bit of the confidence of them coming in, like they, yeah. where they would come in because they knew that they could get that thing next week, yeah. and they also might buy like a paint or some primer or some glue or whatever it is that their hobby want was for that moment. 
you get like you, you lose out a bit on on that like footfall maybe I, I, and i feel yeah and i feel like our like the customer uh relationship it gets a little fractured a little bit and you know because oh, okay. I, I i feel like when they come in and ask if you have something yeah it's the third time and you say no and i and i have to be the like oh i don't i don't have it and i'm, I'm i don't know when i'm getting it it's it's to, hmm. to me because i'm the face of games workshop in that moment right oh that's interesting and, that's interesting and i point. and yeah. i feel like um uh, I have to almost explain what's going on and, and give them more of an explanation an for it. Yeah. But it, sometimes it can almost sound like ridiculous. Like, that, you know, it's like, I don't know that the person will take that seriously or, or believes me. Sure. Right. So um, it, it can be difficult, right? Like being that face and, and trying to like explain what's going on. And because well, you're, uh, you're, you're front, you're front facing staff at that point. Like yeah, exactly. You are the person in front of uh, their experience and there's no, there's no differentiation for them as to who's selling their games workshop product or any other product it could be infinity it could be whoever. How, how much do you think, cause you said pre pandemic, how much do you think the differences in global shipping have affected this? Like the, the just, it's a different logistics and supply. Yeah, chain it has, it has to be massive. Like I, I, I always give them the benefit of the doubt. I can't imagine that this is what they want to be doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you I know? can't either. That's I can't like, thing. and you can't That's imagine it, like every, and there's no way this is quantifiable, but like right. the amount of missed opportunities, it's like in just in my shop, sure. it's got to be measurable, like across the whole chain, yeah, right? Across so, yeah. a couple thousand yeah, retail chains in North America or retail stores in North America, like that's that's got to be a uh, someone has to be feeling that somewhere. And and yeah. it's funny because I think I think that's a you can you can see that pre pandemic post pandemic shipping problem in lots of industries, but it almost feels like it's also the thing that's like throttling this release schedule where you have to move it through your warehouse so fast and just yeah. get it out of the, it can't stay. So it has to come out all at once and then land and yeah. we're not making any more of it because there's a thing behind it on the conveyor belt that has to come out and not stay. And it's weird because it, one, I'm personally super not used to that in my, in my purchasing patterns for, for this stuff. And you as like the, the front end of that having to, to, to be the person that's the last step of that mm -hmm. supply chain, it must feel really different. So like if you can't, if, if, if all you're selling is new releases, like what's the impact of that? Well, and here's a, here's a little quick story about, about a particular item. Just, I'm just picking one random thing, but sure. it kind of, I think articulates what's going on uh, to a large degree. So um, the horse heresy Scorpius missile tank. Okay. Right. So, um, uh, you know, horse heresy, I'd say like, at least from in our shop does, does pretty well. Um, when new kits come out, like we sell like at least a handful. Um, but because of like supply storage and stuff like that, like they, they, these items were on allocation and stuff like okay. that. So you're not getting as many as you want on release. And what we're finding is like, so for that particular item, it went, it went out of stock immediately. Very, very cool. So you couldn't, right. you couldn't buy popular, one. Very popular, popular item. Right. And then, you know, I have people asking me on a weekly basis, when are you getting more? So like people ca basically cash in hand, you know, wanting to, wanting to buy. And and what happens over time is like that that person just stops asking, right? So mm. and then that item comes back in stock, let's say four or five, we're talking four or five months later, right? And you know, we finally, you know, if and if and if I don't keep a, a like a, a careful marker of that, and I don't have that experience about what what's going on in that situation, um, what happens is if I or over order based on the demand I had, right? What happens is that item comes back in and then like no one wants it anymore because it's mm. they've already moved on, right? So right. It, it's 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 almost I don't know what it is specifically, but it's there there are a lot a lot more things than ever before coming out, obviously, being released, and some things are just getting steamrolled over, right? Hmm. So that's an interesting item because like you know I just remember restocking that item this week. I'm like oh I finally have this after five months, and I'm like I don't know that anyone cares. Yeah, because everything's changed. The landscape's different, and people are like excited about different things. Yeah, all of and a uh, wow. like, don't get me wrong, it's going to sell, uh, but it, not <clears throat> not how it could have five months ago, right? So, right. so if, that, that's, if you'd had if you yeah. had like a full rack of them, yeah. Basically. So, so I I do wonder a bit about that sort of what what's the what's the feedback like on that, right? Like, um, how do, how are they measuring something like that, like uh, the Scorpius tank, you know, how it's going to sell now over time, mm -hmm. but they missed. It's great. Like it's great. Uh, every item's greatest potential is when it comes out. Of course, yeah. The for, moment, for that, the moment for that it's window, hottest. right? Yeah, so it's that, that that window of like it's new, it's exciting. Yeah. So so that's that's just kind of like a random item that just kind of like comes to mind. But um, there's there's a lot of things like that, and then and then there's it's funny because you get items like that, and then on the flip side, you get things where they're completely uncapped and they clearly printed things like an insane amount of something. Like what? Like Leviathan. Really? Yeah. Okay. 
So, so because because what was the what was the one that everyone complained they couldn't get their hands on? Was it Age of Darkness? Was that Indominus? Indominus. Indominus was the was the the Necrons one. The what the, the ninth edition one. The one in between eighth and ninth. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And yeah. I think you know, as a business owner, um, you kind of have to. I hope <laughs> uh, keep keep in mind. You know, while you're going through the pandemic, you're like. This is not a normal economic time. Sure, yeah, that's right. <laughs> everything no, you're doing, everything is different. Everything right you're doing yeah. right now just doesn't count, almost. You okay. know, and at least I felt that way. And we were always waiting for the day that things were just going to change mm. um, and kind of go back to normal or a new normal, right? So, I think we're in that new normal period now. Right. Uh, things are definitely not pre-pandemic. They're very different. I think um, all the companies are different as well. Like they're, they're still evolving and changing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, I'm sure these conversations are going on a games workshop. Um, what, what, what do we do going forward? Like if, if we're just going to be out of stock of, are we just going to be out of stock of this, these many products all the time mm -hmm. because we release so much stuff and, or are they, do they have a plan where they're going to be planning to fix that? Right. Cause it, well, I mean, that's, that's a whole other business model. Yeah. Like, and the times that you and I worked for games workshop, the, the, the thing that was always taught it basically it, uh, yeah, it almost uh, as like an intrinsic value was it's a subscription business yes. right it's it, yeah. it's it, everyone is here so that the people that are the consumers have a long term good experience and that they 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 stay with us for a long time mm -hmm. right it's not it's not selling cars it's selling the cars where your grandfather sold cars you know what i mean where you're a ford man or you're yeah. a gm man and there's right. a relationship between you and your car dealer and they take care of your car for it like it's it's that idea that like you you're you're going to take a person who's never seen this stuff before because it's such a weird oddity of a product mm -hmm. and you're going to raise them into feeling competent and confident and they're going to go off and do that to somebody else that was the that was always the idea right is that you're you're raising the next generation of hobbyists and they're going to go teach the next generation of hobbyists and that's how it it basically was this weird little niche industry that persevered and became a thing that now has value, has an IP that's valuable, right? And makes money off of just the idea of it more than anything else right. than just the toy soldiers. Um, how how compatible do you think that is with the way that stuff is coming out now? Like with if you are a subscription person and the idea is that you are slowly consuming and becoming uh, competent with something and you're feeling comfortable with it and you're coming back to it over and over again. How do you think that sort of like full throttle release schedule and kind of focus on it's here and it's, it's all the, this, the, it feels more like an Apple type release schedule where it's always the newest thing mm -hmm. and things phase out and things drop off and you cannot use your product from eight years ago anymore because it's no longer the current product. Like we, you just came, went back in the warehouse and you saw the rack of books <laughs> that I have. <laughs> So, so that yeah. one side of that book rack, maybe 15% of it is currently usable in the game and none of it is older than this studio. That's wild. That's wild. Right. Yeah. So think about that. So there's, there's books there going back to eighth edition and first edition AOS and there's, and, and there's probably a hundred books there and maybe 15 or 20 of them are, are current books. Well, I, I, you, you probably remember, like I, I specifically remember when you worked for games workshop, um, being told a lot of time, don't don't focus on new releases. Like, you know, focus on your core business model, yeah, which yeah. is, and you know what, it's a great message because like, most people don't have all the things that are on your shelf. So <laughs> getting in your head that like only the only the new releases matter is, is kind of a silly. Yeah. You know, everything someone doesn't own is a new release. That's kind of like the way to think about it, right? Yeah. And I think we're dating ourselves here too because you and I have no idea what the internal messaging no. is right now. Games no, Workshop. We should say that as a PSA. Yes. Like, yeah. we are speaking from our our very long ago now past experiences yeah. with who that who that sort of like that that business was and i don't have any insider information no, I, no, I don't have any of that stuff it, yeah exactly. so yeah and i think um so that was the the philosophy kind of we we kind of got used to and and you know back then you know we you had maybe like a quarter a third of the stuff that's coming out now like it was significantly less. oh yeah. yeah yeah so 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 that made sense uh and and now to to say don't focus on your releases like with just the sheer amount of stuff that's being dumped but also there is nothing else. Yeah. Like if you can't get your current <laughs> that's product right, that's right. in, the, like Correct, that's, yeah. that's kind of the yeah. point I'm trying to yeah. make is like, if you, if the only things you can get are new releases and glue paint and primer, and then sometimes not even glue paint and primer, what are you selling? Yeah. Well, you know, it's a good, uh, a good example too. Is like the new cities of Sigmar. 
Okay. So like, we were just actually back, just chat, talk, chatting about how yeah. how much we both love the new box set. It's it's ooze. I actually love that uh, idea. By the way, the box set that they've been doing. Yeah. The absolutely. Seraphon one was gorgeous. Yep, absolutely. I just find myself wanting to to get them all. You, you feel like you're almost like kickstarting the army. Yep. You're getting like a really good deal. You get like the high quality book. You get all the cards to play with. Oh, and they well, come and with and the Age, it's funny too because Age of Sigmar, all of that stuff sticks around longer. It does. It does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a whole other well, podcast. We'll get into that. Yeah. That's a whole other podcast of like the fact that those items are still valuable are still valid basically in the game for yeah. almost the cycle of that edition typically but what's interesting about that kind of release uh for, for for me at my hobby shop is i find increasingly that i don't have ancillary things to sell so so someone's getting into the new box set they're excited they want to expand their army um they did cut a, back a bunch of the products uh in that range but they're still you know things like the luminarch there's right. like the steam tank there's uh there's a whole bunch of, uh, of things that you kind of need to play the army or, or you might want to play the army. Right. Um, and um, they were out of stock before the box even came out. What do you mean? Like before the City of Sigmar uh, box hit the shelves on okay. Saturday. People you, bought them all? You literally couldn't order um, order any of that stuff. Oh, was it so all white box at that time it too? Is all, it is all white box. Yeah, okay. which, which, which means they're not repackaging it if it's white box. No. It's just being stickered. It's just stickered. And, and it, so for you guys, yeah. the white, white box means product that's like the print on demand stuff yeah. so it's just frames in a standard white box citadel logo and a sticker yeah. that's what it is. basically like the, and the way that we do that in the shop is like uh we basically have like a sign in for right. our, our you know our store sign in for the web store and we can we can order those things we get like a margin basically on 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 those items so um it's not the worst thing that we can't have them on the shelf like right. i get it like there are so many products there's no way they can make they could yeah, they yeah, couldn't no, make there's room. no way no. so so i completely understand why they do it that way and it makes sense but yeah, like that, that is usually the template for release, unfortunately, these days where, you know, you, you have this huge excitement, new army started, and uh, people can't buy anything else for it at that time. So, so it turns into just like, okay, so I'm just selling this box, right? Which is okay, but <laughs> usually it's the other stuff that's the gravy, right? So, well, it's the stuff they come back for next week. Like, that's, yeah. that's I guess, my question yeah. is if that's because the subscription is not one issue it's you buy the first big cool starter issue and then you come back for the next issue well, and next people week. are it's it's, it's kind of like the difference between streaming services and, K and network tv whereas streaming services have even started to have to emulate network tv because if mm -hmm. they just dump a whole season of something that doesn't get them subscribers that doesn't right. get them you you need that episodic release of things to keep people subscribed and they are the definition of a subscription business yeah dumping a little bit of stuff out right away and having it get consumed and not having anything for them next week that put them on a treadmill where they had to make new tv shows constantly and they're not all going to be good right so what do you keep coming back for next month and what do you keep what do you keep staying on that subscription for? well and that's and then and then so so what's happening is the you know you're looking at the week after and you're like okay what's coming out that week and it's it's got nothing to do with cities of sigmar so now you've if, if you sold the cities of sigmar box to a customer there's no continuity for that customer, mm, right? Okay. So, and, and you know, at the end of the day, it is still a, a hobby where people are building armies, right? <laughs> right? At the end of the yeah. day. Yeah, and, yeah. And, to, and to build a legal as, army, to build an army that you can actually play As game great too, as right? that box set is, it is nothing close to an army, right? So, yeah. so that person gets their book, they're looking through, they're excited, they want to buy additional things and there's no way they can so they can't get the griffin they can't get the luminarch they nope. can't get any None of that of stuff it, yeah. so they either have old city sigmar stuff or yeah, they don't exactly it's funny because that's there's an argument i hear this argument online all the time is there is that with games workshop rules drive sales and you want to have the best rules to drive the newest things and they only care about selling the newest things they don't care about selling the oldest things and it's like but but then they can't if they sell them once and they never sell them again then the rules don't drive sales mm -hmm. and very often you want to buy the things that you can no longer get your hands on i don't think that's true i don't think the rules driving sales thing is true um because i don't think they sold a lot of extra wraith knights during 10th edition launch i think a bunch of wraith knights that were on the secondary market that were floating around half built or built from eighth and ninth edition when they weren't very good got bought up and stripped sure. and repainted sure. or, you know, professionally painted and bought because people didn't want to paint or came out of a box somewhere. I don't think games workshop sold any extra Eldar shit. It's yeah. It's, it's an interesting question. Cause did like, you, that's my question then. Did you sell an absolute plethora no. of the best army no, no, in 40 no. K in the last like two no. months? No, no more than any other army really. Yeah. How many Wraith heads yeah. did you sell? Maybe, How, maybe one. Could you get your hands on them? 
<laughs> so then it didn't even matter. So they didn't even make them anymore. Yeah, no. So, yeah, I mean, I, part, part of me is thinking, obviously, it's, it's, it's working in the sense that, like, they have, they're getting sell-through on right. all the things they're making. And then they're making a safe, conservative amount of things and then getting sell-through. And if, they're, if their focus is to move these, like, new products that nobody has then that, that almost has to be the focus point because, right. because like you said, the, the hottest things people want to build and collect for their armies are, are not in stock all the time, right? So Yeah. And, and how, well, I mean, to me, it's like, how do you... Uh, I, I don't know how that marries with like the traditional game store experience for you. Yeah. Where you're trying to get people mm -hmm. to come back week on week um, because that's literally how the doors stay open. And and like, maybe that means, and I don't want to sound like doom and gloom, but like <laughs> maybe that means the brick and mortar store is dead, but then where do people go to play? Like it, there's, there's so much more ramification for this, especially in a market as dominated by a single company yeah. as the tabletop wargaming one. Well, let's be, right? let's be real right away. It, it, this sort of business model is only, is, is pre pre predominantly going to uh, benefit uh, online business. For sure, for yeah. sure, like one hundred percent does because, like I said before, it's it's creating a culture where people are like looking for stuff, right? So you're mm -hmm. you're active. It's almost like if you're a card player, you play Magic the Gathering or something, you're looking for a hot card. You're, right. you know, um, we used to call those customers mercenary customers because like they not not to their fault. They they they, yeah, they, yeah. they 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 weren't really interested where they're buying the card from. It's that they they were looking for a card and they would look everywhere to find it, right? And I think that is more like the way that the customers being trained now is like go find that item. No matter where it is, because like you need it to build your army, so um, and the customers excited, so they want yeah, it. They yeah. want it, right? So and even with some of my most loyal customers, like they're like, you know, look, I, I can get us here. I, I need this, and I'm like I can't blame them for that, right? So sure, it's uh, it's definitely creating that, like, and you know, and I, I'm not saying I don't benefit it from it too. Like we have an online store, and I have people buying things all over Canada for me randomly mm -hmm. um, because like clearly that item's out of stock and they need it, and they so they found it in my shop. Yeah, so, that's really funny that that's that almost like that like American picker style like online shopping yeah. has been a byproduct of this, a byproduct of the fact that you can't just get the thing on demand that you want as like a hobby supply, mm -hmm. right? This model kit that I wanted or this paint I wanted. Or paints this, like, too. Like, paint, don't say the paints are not exempt from this. Uh, okay. A whole like, ra like cer certain, like we'll have like 10 or 15 SKUs of, of Citadel paints that are just kind of rotating through this situation as well. Are they like high available. demand ones? Like the texture paints? They or? can be. Uh, uh, sometimes it's just like they're rebottling them and changing the codes sure, and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. So it'd be like uh, a lag. And, and then other time it's in. just like, yeah, this is just like uh, Abbott and Black or whatever, you know, it's like, so... Really, um, black and white are those two big ones? <laughs> I mean, obviously, I yeah. black is every base rim, so but, you're going to sell a lot of it. Yeah, so so it's like something we've never experienced before where like, you know, um, <clears throat> a couple years ago it was inconceivable that my paint order wouldn't be fulfilled, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, so, so yeah, it's a different business now, so it, it's definitely changed. Um, but there, there, like I said, there are benefits as well. Like there is a... a a FOMOism, I guess you could say, that's like created as well from this, right? So there there can be like a fear of missing out that customers have where they like feel like they have to buy something when it comes out because it might just go out of stock for six months. Does that, you think, lead to more of that mercenary well, of course, mentality? Of course it does, yeah. Like, and, and I said, it, it all feeds into the same kind of thing, right? So it's, it's I don't know, necessarily think it's like driving the best behaviors and what we want to see in our customers, but like it's 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 sort of just like the culture we're all getting used to now. So, mm -hmm. um, and again, I, I don't yeah. think this is anyone's fault. No, I think this no. is I think this is a I think this isn't by design. I think no. this is the byproduct of like a massive shift in the way we we deal with retail sales and distribution and logistics. Yeah, and other, if you if you're into any other industries, they're they're going through similar things. Exactly. Right? So things, this is yeah. not a Games Workshop unique problem. So okay. it's really funny because Jay is constantly texting me pictures of his shop. Because and I'm not gonna name names. I'm not gonna dox it where he works, where he works for. But basically, he had he's responsible for making sure that the obviously his his like location is like stocked appropriately, and he constantly has stuff like two release cycles out, and there's nowhere to put it, so it has to be on the shop floor. So it's like, are you excited for Christmas and it's Labor Day? Like for real, like, are you excited for Halloween and it's like Canada day, but you almost it's, it's and like, then sometimes it's, we didn't get our Halloween stuff, but it's January. So we're just putting it out now because oh, it can, and we have to put it on the shop floor. Oof. Like, like that, that level of like disruption is yeah. 
everywhere yes, and yes, everyone's yeah. dealing with yeah. it. So I, I, I really want to like underline for everybody listening to this, yeah. like this is not a unique, like we're not bagging on Games Workshop for this. What we're trying, what I'm trying to explore and why I want to have you in today is to ask you like, what are the impacts? What's the right? reality yeah, right yeah, now? What yeah. is it like out there? Yeah. And then finally, just to talk about how that's impacted this last release, this last big release, which is 10th sure. edition 40K. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, um, and 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 like we can talk about August. I think is like probably the most um, interesting month uh, in a while because they they literally released nothing in the entire month of August. That's wild. And and like a, like a, I can't remember that ever happening ever before in the history of the company. And because you're so on the hook for new releases, that's catastrophic. So so think about what we've just talked about yeah. for for the last half an hour and how the the business is tilting more and more in that direction. Yeah. And how the customers are now like trained and, and, and you know, people yeah. are like looking to what's next and then just turn the tap off all the way for the, for that month. For, for the, what's typical and also the month where you have historically the biggest hill to climb yeah. if you're trying to grow your business like there's like almost, last year. There's almost always something huge in August. Yeah. yeah. Last year was Horace Heresy. The year before was something like. It was Kill Team. Last year was Kill Team. Last year was uh, uh, Into the Dark. Oh, okay. That right? too. Yeah. Because it was yeah. it was July. It was June release. July was the big glut of all the horror right, stuff. Right. And they yeah. just and they did it back to back. They did Warcry and Kill Team in the same month. So they right. had the Warcry new third edition starter set, and they had Into the Dark. So they had basically Space Hulk for forty k. And I think yeah, it's two super hotly anticipated. I think they had sets. like uh, it was just a great month because I think they also had like uh, Levi- the Leviathan Dreadnought came out and like the Spear yeah. and Battle yeah, yeah, came yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, it was just a, like another wave of huge. Horror it was all stuff. the stuff yeah. people wanted, and you know, I, I remember having a stack of like 20 leviathan dreadnoughts yeah. and like just I, think, I came and bought one thinking I to, my, thinking to one. myself yeah. i don't think it can get better than this <laughs> this right, is yeah. pretty great ash has bought you two know? leviathan dreadnoughts uh, and he hasn't actually played any games of war <laughs> yet i'm so happy <laughs> you know and i then, painted both of them and played one more game and that was awesome. all the horse heresy awesome. that we got into us yeah no kidding eh? <laughs> Um, yeah, and then and then you know, uh, and of course, like Games Workshop could not have planned that, obviously, but uh, something logistically happened, and and they had all this that had to come out in the same month. It was yeah, crazy. and now and now you know you're you're staring down that, and you you have nothing coming, and um, yeah, like it, it was a I don't know, it was a rough month. Um, so you know, and when that happens as a as a business owner, you know, you it doesn't take long uh, before you start looking around the boat, and you're like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> is this yeah. gonna is this gonna happen more right so and, and it's it's amazing because like because because the things have been so new release focused and driving customer coming in and, mm-hmm. and, and being in the shop when the new releases weren't coming people just stopped coming too and you don't have anything on your wall from the existing range to sell yep they're still catching yeah. up on that stuff so there, there's this like yeah so we kind of hit that sort of like whoa what's going on here so it really does make you like rethink everything and i know uh, not to like jump into another industry, but I know like like um, Magic the Gathering is an interesting topic right now too. Like it's a whole different business model. But I know like from other game store owners, I know that this has been an ongoing thing with with Magic and yeah. stuff like that. Some of the business practices and decisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, it makes you definitely rethink like how much of my business do I want to be reliant on one company? You yeah, know? yeah, three legged stool problem. And it right? and it's it's scary because like sometimes there's just no option, right? Like. It's not like you can. Oh, I'll just pick the other big miniature company mm-hmm. and, I'll uh, pivot and, 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 and do that. That's not really a thing anymore. Not in this industry. No. Like War Machine's gone. Like gone, gone. Like very. Their boutique very. Gone was very different. This it's year. like a boutique game, basically. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, as as big as Asmodee, even, even as, big, like, as big as Asmodee is, um, like it's just not. It, you can't compare the companies at all. Yeah. Right? It's funny because like you still you well they've also be they're also very new release driven. 100%. Like the, the Marvel yeah. stuff is very like, what's the most recent thing out? And that's what you have access to. Yep. And they don't reprint a lot of the other stuff. And they've started reprinting the original characters too, from the first box run. Yeah. They're doing a new, a new, a new core box. Yeah. The re, 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 kind of relaunching the game, which yeah. is kind of interesting. So yeah. So it, it, you get, you get in an interesting headspace where you're kind of, um, what would you say then? So like just from, uh, to, I, I want to know your unbiased version. Sure. If just from your, and, I, and again, I don't need to like ask you your sales metrics and stuff, <laughs> but like if, if we take all the games or shops and stuff and put it aside, what would be your like ICV two next three down with things that you think you sell the most? Uh, and, and, and I do know that you have a disproportionately large historical community compared to almost every other game store, probably in Canada. Yeah. Um, 
So do I, do you want just, just kit games or do you care about like hobby stuff? Like what do you want? Hobby stuff. I mean, that's you could lump that together as the next thing because yeah. you do. Cause I don't think you could necessarily say that one of those brands mm -hmm. is your thing, but you also have the biggest collection I would say of high end paint and hobby supplies probably in the GTA. Yeah. So, no, so hobby supplies is number one for us. Yeah. Uh, it'd be is it over GTA games workshop. Yeah. Wow. Um, Okay. Now that's a bit skewed because we we do lump like a lot of our um, in terms of analytics we lump a lot of our like paints together. So okay. like GW paints are included in there. So sure. I would have to like kind of chop up the numbers and figure that stuff out. But um, yeah, Games Workshop's obviously uh, like number two, and then the gap between two and three is like really it's massive. Yeah. Okay. It's, so what are, what are the three after that then? You think? Um, probably it's probably all the. Uh, board games and card games we sell. I kind of like categorize that together because okay. it's something we don't really focus on. Um, but in terms of miniature games, uh, to, to be honest, like Infinity, Marvel, Star Wars, kind of throw all the Star Wars games in together. They they all kind of pull the same. They're mm -hmm. all kind of like, it, it would be basically who had the biggest, newest release recently. And if you put all those together, <laughs> no, it, does it not equal a, no. Games Workshop? Not no, a, really? Not, not in our shop, not even close, yeah. Wow. Not even close, yeah. Okay. And you can, you know, you get a visual representation of that when you come into my store too. For sure. Right? But, but, and yet if you lump all these different, uh, like bespoke, like hobby supply companies together, it's bigger than Games Workshop for you. So what's, what brands are in there for you for your, for like, let's say your paint lines. Um, so, so, so our airbrushes are, are probably number one hobby item. And that, okay. that, that's got a lot to do with like, you know, we've, we've kind of really built sort of like a, a culture, a, of that. a culture of that. Like we're, we're a great service spot. So like. The nice thing is people like they get i don't even know what you how you would describe it but like the whole experience so they get the teaching they get yeah, the, that's right you guys teach everybody buy it they store. they get the service end of it too because yeah. we, we fix people's brushes and stuff and then all the parts and supplies and stuff so it's like their whole life cycle there is like we we, can't, we take care of all that it's almost like a car dealership sure like yeah, brushes, yeah. Right? yeah so yeah. so that's kind of become our number one hobby item um uh, paint brushes are probably number two and then well, maybe paints would be number one if you group them all together, but like separately, they, they kind of yeah, occupy yeah. all the other spaces. Um, Scale 75 is big for us just because like we kind of like are so all in on all their brands. So, yeah. so they have like five or six ranges. You have the tube paints and stuff as well. You have all their different brands. Yeah, we kind of just like built a really good relationship with Brian, who's their head of uh, sales in US. Like we met him at Adepticon like seven yeah. years ago. As, uh, as Adepticon yeah. goes. And that's, that's uh, good for. it is great. It is actually a great, if you have a hobby shop, it is a great place to go just to like build those relationships. It's, better than like, gamma. it's way better than Gamma. Way yeah. better yeah. than Gamma. And, uh, and so, so we kind of just say yes to everything they put out. Cool. Um, it's not an easy product to carry. Uh, there's, there's, there's all the logistical issues of getting it up from the States. Sure. Um, this is one frustrating thing about being a Canadian store is we don't make anything here. Yeah. And anytime something crosses a border, yeah. it Your gets, margin gets massively hammered. hammered. Yeah. So you end up charging a much more premium price for something that, you know, if it was just sold in Spain. Yeah. And the consumer would, doesn't understand or care about that. No, they don't. They, they don't. look online and go, but I can just get it. And yeah. it's like, yeah, well, your prime membership's paying for all that, unfortunately. Well, and I also <laughs> get the situation a lot of the time where people, uh, I, I get messages online about the online store. People are like, oh, why, well, you know, I can buy this from directly from them for X. And until they get the bill for the duty and they paid the shipping yeah. and they total it up until, at the end. Until customs basically and they and they, and they paid more. Like, yeah. I, it's hard to get them to understand that, like, you know, this is just what the, the reality of what it's going to cost to sell it again. And, and we're paying too. Like, yeah. that's, I think that's the thing that people forget yeah. is that, like, as, as, a, uh, as, a, as a retail store, you pay the same thing that, oh, the, yeah. um, that the consumer pays, but you pay it up front before you've ever sold it. So they, they at least get the product and pay the duty. Yep. You're like, I might sell this, but I still have to pay the taxes on it like right away in the beginning yeah. and bring this in. That's right. It's one of the reasons why certain countries just have to pay this giant premium on their, their hobby products because they no one makes them and they don't have like any kind of free trade like EU sort of agreement or whatever. Mm -hmm. The UK right now is getting hammered for getting almost anything because they ended their relationship with the EU. So they have to like pay important stuff on paints and brushes yeah. and stuff like it, it's very funny how that's that's actually quite good for games workshop because they're the only one game in town that makes the paints and stuff but everybody else all of a sudden is paying all kinds of duties and tariffs they didn't have before and it's kind of shocking for them you don't realize what a massive uh, asset it is that like to have like a dis like a local distributor like right bring something in and carry it until yeah. you've like done it yourself and yeah. <laughs> realize just how, how well, didn't you do that for who was it you did that for for a minute there was some miniature or no you knew a guy that was doing that was 
was it night models I think I'm losing there's a guy is yours coming off now too down, yeah. okay just push it back on here i'll hold the table you just push it back on it's like the pad is like coming loose because we've we've tried to make these fit on a table they do not fit on you gotta do the bottom it's the bottom one you gotta tighten up yeah yeah you gotta tighten them and then, uh, then crank that sucker down a little tighter I'm sure everyone's super enjoying listening to us fuck with our mics. <laughs> there you go. Oh, it's hey. way better. Way better. Way Oh, I just got to make sure I don't undo it by putting it back down now. There you go. No, oh. you're good. It's like way in your face am I, now. Am I good, though? No, you're not. It's falling off again. You fucked it up. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I'm just going to pause this. Hang on. <laughs> so for those of you just catching up, <laughs> you, for those of you can't or just listening to this and not watching it, I have literally just engineered a solution that I probably should have just done in the beginning. <laughs> but like an asshole, I made Chris sit here and watch me do this for the whole thing. I literally, like, and now I can even like just tie, I can like actually touch like the monitor and stuff like that, and like up and down my my gain. Oh, this is so much better. <laughs> this is this is a vast improvement. I can pull on this. Look at look at how tight it is. So yeah, I went and got some pump clamps and uh, just made myself a a a. a a place to actually clamp these things down on this is way smarter i can even turn and face the camera now even if i Whoa. wanted to i know don't, let, don't let's not crazy. let's not get too let's, let's not, not do too, too much in the first episode you know <laughs> that's true <laughs> can't give this away is, the farm this is the live fire this is this is the pilot though where we just we 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 basically make it up as i call it so much you guys are getting such an insight into how i live my entire life extra, where it's all just gorilla. made up it's an extra gorilla it's all made up as it goes along that's a made up word hash all words are made up <laughs> oh man uh, um so what we were talking about was we were talking about this summer um in august and the fact that nothing basically had come out yeah um and we're now on september 9th when we're wait 8th 8th when we're recording this um and you've had to have a big think about like what that meant so what if if that big pie is like mostly paints for you like and and we were just kind of like dithering about like what it means to bring in those products that don't necessarily have as high a margin the volume's high but the margin's low and then all of a sudden you got games workshop products where the margin's pretty good and the volume's high when it's all new releases. Sure. But yeah. there's no like extra leg on the stool if one of right. those goes out. And, and you know, of course, like you can bring in as many hobby products as you want, but at the end of the day, you know, the driver for people using those and buying those is still collecting and building and painting armies. Right. right? So there's like a good time on it. So, you know, what you find is when 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 things are really hot, when releases are hot, when you got lots of kits moving, you tend to also be selling a lot of paints and brushes and primer well yeah they kind all, of all the good stuff like, they kind of do yeah. go hand in hand <laughs> so it's not like when you have a month where nothing's coming out you know, people are just coming and being like i'm so excited to work on things yeah it's not and you know i think it's the double edge also like summertime well, and the internet doesn't stop no like that's the other thing is yeah. like even though there was nothing in your store everyone was still talking about the things that might come out in the correct, future correct yeah and it was all but it was but none of it did any good for you well and here's the double-edged part of that right and this is something i'm sure they're worried about too is is whatever was supposed to come out in august is now going to get added to a month that already probably had a lot of stuff on the docket yeah and there's only so much money in the pie well that's just it right so now so now something that might have been like two or three weeks of releases maybe it's going to shrink down to one sure and i just feel like you know and then once again as a shop owner you're you you're thinking like well so i'm not necessarily going to make the same amount of money now right mm -hmm. on that stuff right so well people's fun money doesn't just accumulate yeah exactly. <laughs> it gets spent on whatever they're gonna people, have fun people with spent month. money in yeah. august people spent that's money right. in august it just wasn't it just wasn't on hobby stuff necessarily right yeah. so it's uh it, it's it's that it, it kind of puts you in a mind state like i was talking earlier about like you know when when eighth edition came out I think as a store owner, I was still in that like take chance, yeah, get more than I think I need sure. sort of mentality. I've definitely evolved more into like be conservative, mm -hmm. get what you need, right, right. Don't don't order, over order, yeah, because that stuff can really kill you as a business, right? How, so, how does that impact though the fact that you can't get stuff afterwards? Like, do you do you yeah. feel nervous about it then? Where you're always like, every release is nervous, really, and, and I think we talked never get about it back this in again. Yeah, Leviathan to me, um, when it came out, and and we were it was the first time. I remember a big box set coming out where I just, I felt more stressed than I felt happy. Really? Why yeah. is that? Um, and it has to do with all these things. I was like, I, I had a hard time measuring what's the demand going to be like, how many of these did they make um, coming off of, coming off of Dominion, which I felt was a fantastic product, but mm -hmm. they clearly made too many of. Mm -hmm. um, so you had a bunch left over afterwards. 
every store was sitting on it. Like we, we luckily, our pile wasn't massive, but yeah. it was a pile. There um, were some stores that were just, there were some stores that had like 80, yeah. 60, a hundred. Yeah. And the result of that this is, this is the age of Sigmar Domain for those. Yeah. Listening. Yeah. yeah. And, and it sucks because it was such a phenomenal product. It's um, a great box. And yeah. we still sold a lot of it. I think the company sold a lot, but I think they just like, they missed the mark on how many to make. Right. Mm. And um, so, so we were coming off of that. And as a store, you're sort of thinking like, I can't afford this box, $300 MSRP yeah. Canadian. I can't afford to have like 10 of these sitting on the shelf no, for a year, God, no. right? So it just gets you in this mindset where you're like, I just kind of want to sell sell through and then be done with it, you know? Yeah. Um, which is unfortunate. Like, you know, that's not where my mind was a few years back, right? And um, so, yeah, until things kind of change a little bit, I, that's kind of where, you know, you kind of have to be, I think, as a business is like, you just kind of want to sell out if you can. Mm-hmm. And then you're just like, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? It's kind of created that situation, right? Where was 40K at pre that? Pre 10th? Pre 10th. Like that's, I think that's the other question is like, if your mind, if you're like, if you're not sure about 40K pre 10th, like, why is that? Why are you not feeling like it, it, it sh- like even at the end of seventh edition 40K, people were playing tons of 40K. Oh yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, and it was yeah. all it was very like it was very like in the hobby store, and people were excited about the products coming out. The Knights had just gotten released. Like there was a lot of like buzz. Yep. And the Eighth Edition came out, and it just seemed to like snowball. Everyone was like, I played more. I played more Eighth Edition Forty K than I've played any Forty K I think since Fourth. Mm-hmm. Like I played tons of Eighth Edition Forty K. Oh, and I loved Eighth Edition Forty K. And like slowly, it seemed to like uh, get more and more like like muzzles on it if that makes sense because mm-hmm. it was so open ended at the beginning we're just like match keywords and play make an army and play a game and we were like yeah cool we can make these armies from the stories that have like an inquisitor leading them and all this like mix me and you know in your painting model kits just because you like the model kit sure, now you sure. can include it in your army because it's imperium yeah and the, that slowly kind of got walked back into like ninth edition mm-hmm. and we were i mean still like it's a fun game but it was it got more top heavy and more process driven and sure, slower sure. to play with bigger things and more stuff. And that's my experience. That's my anecdotal experience. What was your experience like in the shop? You're watching people play 40 K people play games in your store. What did it look like pre 10th edition? Like at the end of ninth? Yeah. I, I think things have been very consistent actually, like in terms of like gameplay and general interest, like 40 K despite all the noise the company makes and, sure. and all the stuff like, at least in our, in, in my kind of narrow view, um, things, things and your, your views broader than mine, right? You, yeah, well, sure, sure. Um, <laughs> but like, it's still like, you know, uh, across the whole chain, it's so, so small, such a small picture. Sure. Right. So, yeah. and I, and I mean, like, I think that's also, um, because Jay and I are kind of a little bit like, we're not super competitive guys. Yeah. We kind of just like collect armies and paint models and you foster the culture. It, it definitely creates have, that yeah. culture. So I think like our customers maybe care a little bit less about chasing that stuff. So, so you I, might be, we we're outliers. Yeah. So, so let's just like, you know, keep that as a grain of salt or whatever. Um, so I feel like we have a bit more of a, like a consistent sort of like uh, interest, I guess. But, um, yeah, I mean, um, I haven't really seen a huge bump necessarily, um, from the new, from the new box. Um, and I, yeah, I don't know. It's, 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 it's interesting. Like it's hard to understand. So there's not more people playing. I, I think, I think there's more people playing now. Sure. I think they've got that. They've definitely hit that out of the park. I think. I just mean like in your stop shop yeah. in front of you, are the same people playing the new edition? Are there more people that you haven't seen before coming in and playing the new edition? Like, that's what I'm curious about. What's the, what's the, like, what's the sort of like, uh, what does it mean to you as a business person six months ago? Where ninth edition forty k is mm-hmm. happening in your store and it's driving sales and your releases are coming out, and what does it mean today, two months after Leviathan's come out? Yeah, I think it's it's early days for sure, but I think I think we have a lot of potential. Like a new potential is there for sure um, that hasn't been tapped yet. Now, what was that like? Now, what was like that that same thing? If we're talking about eighth edition. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm gonna have, I'm stretching my memory to to yeah. kind of think because like so much happens in the shop, you just like kind of like sure. it just all gets jumbled or whatever. But uh, I think every every edition has that same feeling for a lot of people. Okay, um, that's that's similar. I think the customer always looks at it like the the the, the customer that's coming back. I should say because mm-hmm. that's that's a, co- a common recurrence in our hobby is like the returning customer. Sure, people take time off, they come back, yeah, they yeah, come, yeah. come back, 
every edition is always this like new jumping on point. People feel really comfortable kind of exploring. Yeah. And 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 the t- tenth is probably like the most accessible kind of on ramp they've had uh, probably ever. Cool. Um, why would you say that? Like, why do you think it's so accessible? I just think the the free nature of the rules. I think. Uh, has has like the fact that you can just like get the pdfs for free you can just start playing i think that's amazing and um you know as a as a shop like i've i remember 15 16 17 years ago you know we in games workshop we would get like 30 or 40 of a new codex Mm -hmm. and sell through on a weekend gone yeah that's that was the thing that was the, the we, books and we were, would tell and we would tell people like it's Tiernid Codex weekend. Yeah, it's massive. If you yeah. want one, get here before noon because they're probably all going to be gone. Because the book would always come and out first. Little yeah. twenty dollar books. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, and they yeah. would come in and grab the little soft cover twenty dollar yeah. books. Yeah, and uh, and 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 now it's like, I don't know. It's it's such a fraction of that, right? So okay. I think most shop owners, if they were being really honest, would would say, you know, I could lose the revenue on the books. Okay. Uh, if if we got that accessibility for the players, I think, making it approachable. Because at the end of the day, it is about like selling the kits to people, right? Yeah, selling the kits, Absolutely. getting people to to focus on buy. And I, you know, money obviously isn't limitless. So like you know, the Tyranid release that's coming up is a great another great example. Um, people only have so much cash to throw around. As a, as a store, what would you rather have someone? You know, you were thinking, what would you rather have someone take home with them? Do you really want them to take home the the, the new Tyranid Codex and a kit, uh, or just the new Tyranid Codex? 70 bucks msrp or whatever um you know that product is only going to be in cycle for 12 to 24 months probably Usually the, the high, 12, end, yeah. 12, 12, high end 24, 24 months high, yeah and if your clientele is a bit more casual and they don't play as often yeah you would, honestly like i would just rather that person bought models because i know they're going to be there's a greater chance that person's not going to be as like jaded by the experience sure right yeah, yeah. So that's something that's definitely been on my mind for sure as well, um, and I and I wonder what if that if that is in the future um, something they they'd be considering because I know book printing isn't isn't getting any cheaper and the shipping mm-hmm. logistics. Can you close that door behind us? Oh. I'm just I'm hearing I'm just I just realized I'm hearing the warehouse. Yeah, I don't know, man. I I think that the I think that you're right in that I think books. It, and they've said, I mean, I said that earlier, I joked about that whole like games workshop thing where it's like books are made to sell models. And that is a common sort of like, uh, I think saying of games workshop, but I think at the same time for the store owner, it, it, when we talk about that classic, like, um, uh, <laughs> you look like you're diffusing a bomb right now. <laughs> you're trying to, you're trying to creep very, very back careful. in so quietly. I don't think anyone listening cares. I After think, all I think the rattling just, before, you yeah. could have just pulled the chair back. It's true. I didn't do that yeah. very gorilla. We have, actually, no, yeah. it was not very gorilla at all. It was so gentle. I love how pre- I'm so appreciative of how gentle you are. I am not that way. Um, I think that the uh, I think that the like traditional cycle of like there's like a staged release where it's like book and something key to the book and then send them out and let them digest that book and know what they want next. And then next couple things come out and then next yeah. couple things come out. I think we got very used to that. And it, that just might be our age talking about how sure. we do our sure. hobby and consume our yeah. hobby. Um, I, I do, I do. I think I'm starting to get accused of being out of touch a little bit with <laughs> the current meta and hobby and, and playing and stuff like that. And I think that's probably correct. I think those mm. accusations by people are correct because I don't think I I don't approach Games Workshop's products from the from the same way that the people who are ha- who are a vast majority of the discourse right now, even coming from Games Workshop, approach them. Yes, and I think that's okay. But I think the Games Workshop makes products for my sort of personal hobby uh, because they want my money, and I think they make them for other people's and i think the difference is what is the volume of the communication and how does the way that they are they are making those products affect you as the end point of like the supply chain and then me as the consumer and then those other consumers because i don't want to speak for them i'm not i'm not speaking for them i i I think that i think it's dangerous to think that you speak for anybody i'm really just speaking for myself of course but but I can't eat the pasta this fast. And I also don't want to, I don't want to not sit and think about my projects and make projects that make me happy. So like 
the idea that I can't go into your store and be like, oh man, I really, I never did get around to making that all mounted Ogre Kingdom's army that I always wanted to make. Mm-hmm. I'd sure like to get like four Thunder Tusks. Hey, Chris, can right. you get me four Thunder Tusks? And you go, oh, Ash. <laughs> <laughs> they have made Thunder Tusks since 2019. <laughs> and I'm like, the fuck are you talking about? They don't make Thunder Tusks anymore. You know what I mean? Like, that that idea of and i think it's probably just what i'm used to and maybe that won't be what people are used to in the future maybe that won't be what people come up with anymore where like they have this like dream army or this dream thing that they've always wanted to make and then they finally find the time or the energy to go do it and they can go do it yeah i think we we may, we may be at a t- turning point it's too early to say i th- i think just based on my own experience in the shop um the vast majority of purchasers are still I would categorize as ca- casual hobbyists. Okay. So, so, you know, and I, I don't think that's the fact that the discourse has always kind of been, I think, more dominated by um, people that play meta sort of stuff. Oh, I kind of, you know, yeah. Like, well, everyone's just going to play Eldar then. Like, wow, yeah, and, and, and they're always the loudest people. I don't think that's ever been any, any different. I think the major key difference is that they're being spoken to for the first time okay. uh, by the company. Like, they're being directly spoken to. Like, because... Um, for the longest time, I think like Games Workshop almost like didn't acknowledge competitive play in, in, a, in any sort of serious way. And in the last number of years, they put a serious effort into um, uh, creating products for those people, articles, sort of like really engaging those people, right? So I, I don't know if it's too early to see like if that's taking over the business and becoming the way that you like, you know, quote unquote, consume the products. Mm-hmm. Um, but it ha- it hasn't it hasn't necessarily taken over um, at at least at the ground level where people are are buying things. Like sure. people are still getting into the hobby because they want to play games with their friends predominantly. Because the conversation isn't the landscape, right? Correct. And that's that's Correct. really why yeah. I was interested in not that's a great way to put is, it. Yeah. Is that is that you are more the fabric of the landscape, and that's why I really wanted to have this conversation. Yeah. It's like, and so if 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 that's not if if Eldar being the greatest thing ever or Mortal Wounds being bad for Warmer 40,000 is actually bad, then no one would be coming in and buying things. Does right. that make sense? Exactly. Like they yeah. wouldn't be buying other stuff. They wouldn't be buying Space Marine tanks. They wouldn't be yeah. buying. So if you're saying that that you that it doesn't seem to have actually disrupted any of the purchasing patterns apart from we don't have anything to sell that's new this month and that's a big deal. Yeah, like, yeah. I think I think the I think the only danger that you have, and we've seen this happen, and I've I've honestly felt this experience myself most recently with the last uh, season of General's Handbook. It was the first time a book came out, um, and it actually made me play the game less. Not because I didn't like the book, but because I realized that because it was like ending, you know, it was such a short window and sure. it was ending. I f- didn't feel like playing games towards the end of it because it, I was waiting for the next one. Right, because it was I, just the end of this season of Girl. Yeah, right? it's, it's just kind of like focused and on... And I was never... I, I was yeah. like, I've never felt like that before where like hmm. I was like, oh, I shouldn't play because like it, it doesn't matter or like that I'm, I should wait for the next one. Hmm. So so I was like, oh, that, that's that's interesting. And, and, and a lot of my customers, I think, feel the same way um, in terms of uh, the, the sort of like higher pace of um, rules and stuff like that, I think. The only danger Games Workshop has, I think, because the casual collector and, and painter is still their, their ma- the biggest part of their market, I believe, okay. uh, just from my from my viewpoint. Um, the only danger I think they have is 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 putting those people off with the rapid rate of change. Can we talk about casual then for a minute and kind sure. of find that? Like, because I I have my interpretation of what that yeah, that word great. means. You guys all watching this yeah. probably have your interpretation of what that word means. Um, and and I think it's probably just interesting to hear from you what you think that means. Like, what do you think a casual hobbyist is in, in the landscape of tabletop stuff? Yeah, uh, I think you could define it in a lot of different ways. But I think someone who uh, is is engaged uh, mm-hmm. with, with, with the products, uh, makes purchases, does the hobby in some capacity, whatever that is. Like, you know, not everybody does all the aspects, but whatever. Sure. Um, and I think the thing that keeps that person casual is they don't necessarily like engage in the like online discourse uh, constantly. Okay. Um, they maybe aren't going to like competitive events. Uh, maybe they go once a year, but not every month or something, mm-hmm. right? Um, 
I think it's just someone who just doesn't take it as seriously, maybe, is like a, a really easy description. Mm-hmm. Um, someone who plays games with their buddies. Okay. That sort of, you know, like. So, so I, you said some things that resonate with me yeah. there. One of them was that the tabletop hobby is an excuse for them to spend time with their friends, not an end unto itself. That's, yeah. I think that's an element of that, like, that, like casual gamer for me, especially. It's mm-hmm. like, we could be, you and I could be doing anything right now. Like yeah. we're, we're talking about work because you and I are desperate workaholics and all we ever do is work. So, so Uh-oh. we're here to talk about work. Like <laughs> I've been it's exposed. Probably, it's probably a bad sign. <laughs> it's probably, probably bad. Probably why we're still friends after almost 20 years. But, but that's like, to me that, that we could be spending our time doing anything. We're choosing to do about this because it's a thing we both enjoy and yeah. like we laugh and we have a good time doing that's, then the outcome doesn't matter of the thing you're doing. It's the time you're spending together. That's a big element of like that casual mm-hmm. thing for me. That's one type, I think. They're pretty, I think we're pretty immune to the changes, but we're also very prone to move on to a thing that satisfies us with less hangups. Like for me to like paint a bunch of 40K miniatures and then be like, I play some games. I really enjoyed. I had a good time because I hung out with a person that I like. But then also go the next time I go to do that, be annoyed by something or ha- be frustrated or not even frustrated, but like be like kind of worn out by it. Like uh, I had to do a whole bunch of work again. Like I couldn't just come back to this and enjoy that time the mm-hmm. same way with mm-hmm. my friend. Uh, I think I'm both more and less susceptible to it. I'm more likely to come back next time. But if it becomes work. I'll just do something else. You and I will hang out and do something else. You know what I mean? We'll make yeah. a podcast. Or yeah, we'll talk yeah, about yeah, plants. Yeah. Or we'll like move a gaming table. Or like all right. the shit we did this morning. Yeah. And have just as good a time as sure. if we played a game Warhammer 40k. Yeah. Right? Because because it's the time we spent together that was important. So I think the casual people, the ones, there, the, the, there's a generation or maybe like a, a subset of them who are that. Now there are also casual people who are probably less outcome oriented. Mm-hmm. They're That's not caring about who's going to win or lose the game. They like the visual aspects of it. They like the story. They like the way the table looks. They can hear the drums or romantics maybe mm-hmm. about like the history and stuff. They're the guys who will pretend to be space wolves and <laughs> hail brother or whatever online yeah. to each other. And they do spend a lot of time online. Yeah. But the difference is that they're casual from the point of view of the people who are outcome oriented because to to someone who only cares about the whether you won or lost anyone whose frame of reference on how they approach something that doesn't care about that they they marginalize that person's experience and call them mm-hmm. like a casual you're casually interested in who right. wins and loses right whereas that person might walk up to the gaming table we've had this argument a million times and be very very outcome oriented on to whether or not the person they're playing with has a painted army and as you big and me, deal for me it's a big, big deal, deal for you. Me, big yeah. big deal for you yeah. big deal for you right yeah. it's why you like going to adepticon because everyone has a painted army nice painted that's armies. the number really nice that's the armies. number one rule of adepticon everything's yeah. got to be painted no yeah. one painted shit on the tables yeah um, and that was a b- rule from way back. And nobody really talks about that anymore. Have you noticed that? Well, it's funny, but maybe it's a different podcast about Adepticon, but uh, it, w- it would actually brought up quite a bit this year because the competitive scene is getting quite big. Sure. And um, Adepticon is one of the only large tournaments that has a hobby store score still. Okay. So people take issue with that. Some people take issue with that. Why is that? What do you mean? <laughs> no, there's just a sect of the community that, that would like to see that go away. And then, because, you know, it went away for games. For example, right? someone 10, like myself, 10 points in the 40k code, still some filthy painting. casual like myself yeah, yeah. made the top eight in AOS this year. Okay. But I did that largely, I shouldn't say largely, I, I went four and one in the tournament, but, sure. but I would not have been top eight without, without my hobby score. score. Yeah, so, without hobby score, yeah. But that's also why I like the tournament. I like, and I go like back to it. you know, and I go back to it every year. So, and I think a lot of people are similar. So, and well, so short story long, then yeah. that person would also be considered casual, but there is a greater impact on the current state of the game for them when they come to a game night and they're mostly playing strangers. So, if you don't have a group of friends and the point isn't the time you spend together and you mostly go to your game store and mm-hmm. play strangers. You need to have, you need to be playing the game in the currently accepted way of playing the game because you're playing a stranger. You have no prior agreement with them. You have to be current. You have to be up to date. And it becomes really important to you that you are up to date. Mm -hmm. And, and if the outcome doesn't, if the balance, the outcome doesn't matter, but you have to like keep checking and rechecking and rechecking that you're playing the game the right way, that can tire you out. 
Yeah, and I think I think just to, to, to jump in on that point, um, I think that's why we've largely seen the pickup game die off so much. Really? Okay, yeah. t- tell me about that. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, so so like you said, if 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 the if the casual player is um, you know coming back to the game occasionally, he wants to play the odd game. Sure. Um, but like you said, the the the, the new chapter pro- like you said, the standard of pickup games is unfortunately going to be competitive play always because yeah. it has been forever, and, it, and that's just the, the way beginning. it is. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, because uh, you just need a standard for whatever, right? Well, because competitive play typically is two strangers playing each other, hundred percent, yeah. right? That that's mirrored in the game store experience of pickup games. Yeah, pickup games and competitive play are identical in that regard, where you have to have a social contract for how the game's going to be. And it's almost always, well, what is the current competitive way of playing? Yeah. So I, I think, um, uh, I think places that have stronger communities that are people like regularly playing, I, I don't, I think they might still call that a pickup game thing, but I think what you're actually seeing is like friends just getting together sure. at those places and playing consistently. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's where those arguments come in too of like, well, why don't you just, if you don't like it, just play with yeah. the core book, like play with whatever you want to play with. Like, why aren't you doing that? And I don't think that takes into account the idea that you maybe can't because it's right. not your friend group. It's, exactly. But when it is, you can do that. And that's yeah. that online discourse doesn't take any of that stuff into account. It's no. all one brush, yeah. right? It's all like there's a right and a wrong way to do it. And we've, you know, we've we've racked our brain trying to figure out ways around it and that sort of thing. So we're we're experimenting with. We have like a, a new league system that we've in, implemented. We're going to give a try, where we're actually trying to like match people together in the first few rounds mm, that okay. have like similar. You know, they basically fill out a survey first. Before they enter the league, <laughs> honestly, yeah, there's a little bit. Okay, cue for this shit. Exactly, like, we're, really, yeah. we're basically matchmaking uh, <laughs> these games. But I honestly think it's it's important because at the core of miniature wargaming, I think it, it's a social experience. Well, and, you'd be playing video games online otherwise. Well, exactly. If, you, right. if it wasn't for this shit, bring us into the same room to stand and, and yeah. look at and look at like our stop motion movie that we've basically made together happening. Like, what's the point? If 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 the if the if the outcome is the only thing that matters of who mm-hmm. win it didn't win the game, I don't know why you're playing with toy soldiers. And you know what the biggest they they have to matter at some point. They really do, yeah. Right, yeah. like they have their their physical value and the presentation of that stuff has to matter at some point. Yeah. Or 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 I don't know why you're in this. I don't know what you're getting out of it. If it's just like the mental exercise, like I don't actually like. I can't comprehend what that's doing for people. Yeah, because I mean, like, you could even it's make the, the argument. It's the hardest way to prove you're better than someone Even else if you ever. love tabletop games, but you don't care about the models, like, there's tabletop simulator and stuff sure, like that, right? Yeah. So you can get that um, experience in, in other ways. So, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It, ha- it, it, it does have to, it has to revolve around the miniatures for sure, yeah. Well, I'm not saying it's a revolver. I'm well, just I mean, they, they have to be part the, of it. Yeah. They can't, yeah. they can't be marginalized. Yeah. Like, they can't, they can't be nothing. Right, they can't just be pogs. Otherwise, it would just be pogs, and we've seen that happen. Yep. I mean, that happened with Privateer Press, where like you'd go to a Privateer Press event, there'd be no tray on the table, there'd be cut out colored counters that represented two D what everything was, and all the table, all the miniatures would be on one side because they would they, they couldn't perfectly maneuver them because mm-hmm. they were big and they would touch each other and bump into each other and you couldn't place them properly. So everyone was just playing with pogs. Everyone's just playing with proxy bases. The entire game could just been played with bases yeah. towards the end of the lifespan of that game, which is crazy to me because the yeah. miniatures just didn't matter anymore. But the companies only get paid when they sell miniatures, right? Like, and and if and as we've just seen, if you don't have the miniatures for a month, then you don't get paid, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, yeah. you just don't. Yeah. People don't come in. That's a weird. That's a weird life cycle to be on right now. So mm-hmm. what do you? But what do you think that's? What do you think that's going to look like? for you i guess in the future like going into christmas we're coming into the most important four months of the year for any retailer on earth period in the western world i should say but but this is this is your most important sales time and it typically was in my experience selling tabletop products and hobby products it was the culmination of all your hard work if you had a good spring and summer then Christmas was good mm-hmm. because little Timmy that you taught how to paint and dragged through the process of his getting his first 25 space Marines done. Mom and dad would look at that and go, and this is a hype generalization, but they would go, look, he actually did this. Holy crap. He must actually care about it. Yeah. Let's give him a whole bunch of stuff for Christmas. Mm-hmm. And then your existing range was what you sold most right. of that, yeah. most of that season. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If, if we're in this new landscape where you're just getting new releases and when they're gone, they're gone and you don't have a lot of extra stuff on the wall or it's holdovers or random leftovers from, from new releases. What does that mean for Christmas for you in this landscape? Yeah. I mean, luckily, luckily, um, 
because of the way uh, we've kind of run our business over the years, like, you know, you, you get in the situation where you have like ones of things, right? So oh, so during during the busiest time of year when things are moving really quickly, <laughs> gorilla. I just, <laughs> I'm going to start putting this back over here. I was, I was, putting over, I was not putting it over here so it wasn't Boom. the camera shot and then I just fucking banged it into the spoon mic. This is, I'm so glad this is the first. I'm so glad you're here for the first one. Jay and I would have completely destroyed this room. Oh my gosh. Now. You're so much calmer than I am. <laughs> I'm at, a, I'm at a soft 11 this entire conversation. Oh, man. So um, because we're used to having basically like ones of every, you run, you run such a lean inventory right. um, when you have a business usually. Um, you're kind of used to sort of like being out of stuff. Okay. So I actually think I'll be pretty comfortable. Like customers are also like just looking looking for a gift. So like people are a lot more flexible at Christmas time. Mm-hmm. We sell a lot of gift cards and stuff like that. So I actually feel like it's probably not going to be too bad um, based on based on like how things are going and inventory and stuff like that. Sure. There's always, I, and I, of course, like people, when people are coming in to buy a gift for somebody, really they're, they're asking like, what can I get this person? Even if they have a list, right? Yeah, and yeah. and if you know your customers well, which we, we take a lot of pride in like knowing people, um, we can offer like an really usually. good sure. like gift ideas, I, right? So I, I guess I guess yeah. I should I should have known that was going to be your answer because you guys have <laughs> well because you have good customer relationships yeah. Yeah. and you take the time to get to know your customers yeah. and you don't necessarily have a ton of strangers or like you called the mercenary yeah. customers coming in, but that's that's going to be the reality for some other places. I would be right? worried. I would be worried about just like people spending less money at Christmas this year. But sure. That's a whole different thing. That's yeah. just the yeah. world is ending. Yeah. yeah. That's right. It's just yeah. gas is gas has been interest rates, two hundred percent what it cost last year. Yeah. Rent. Yeah. Raspberries cost so, enough that my son. I don't know that I can. Addiction to raspberries is a problem. I don't know though. I can fix that problem in the shop. Now. <laughs> like, Thank God cucumbers are cheap because raspberries are putting me in the poorhouse. <laughs> my son will eat an entire basket of raspberries. Wow, I just say day. no. <laughs> you just say no. Oh, that's, I know. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I don't know how big uh, Liam is. You're too nice to your kids. Are I, I think Cash can probably be able to fight me soon. So. Oh yeah, he's, <laughs> he's a big he's kid. Yeah. Big, yeah. yeah. Luckily, Logan hasn't breached forty pounds yet. Yeah, so he hasn't gotten over that. It's very small. Fantastic. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I, that's I. I mean, what a weird place to be. And and this, yeah. I didn't want this podcast to turn into talking about rules and talking about no, stuff like that because no. like that doesn't really matter. But I was very, and ultimately, it matters for a minute. It's patterns. It's big emerging patterns that actually matter to you on the on the ground. And I think that like that that everything all at once, and then we don't necessarily have access to a ton of stuff. That's a bigger, more interesting pattern to talk about. I was really. I'll be honest. I don't, I don't know what it's, what it's going to mean for me as a customer. I typically don't want to buy everything right away. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. I want to look at the book. I want to read it. I want to like digest what's coming out. I guess the digital stuff is going to help that, but you can't unlock the digital stuff without the books from games workshop. Right. Um, I also really like pickup play. I like playing strangers. I mm-hmm. like having new people come in here. Like every time someone comes to visit the studio for the first time is a pickup game, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it does matter to me in a way because I think I'm in that pickup game boat where I want to always be playing it the right way in the current way. Like I could just agree with all my friends to play old games, and we do. It's why mm-hmm. I play older games with you know my my friends and the people that just come to visit like once or twice are the people that I end up playing the current edition of the game with. Um, but like. It, I, I don't know what this means for the future because in the history of tabletop gaming, it's been a subscription business a lot longer than it's been a release driven business. Yeah. I do know what it's done with my Apple purchasing, <laughs> <laughs> right? I do know what's done with my, when, when I've interacted with it in other parts of my life. Um, but I have a vested interest in, in it because I want you to succeed and I want your business to course, be great yeah. and I want yeah. you to, you to be happy and flourish. So like, it, it's it's interesting to talk about because you're basically on the front end of of these changes since the pandemic. Yeah, and I'm sure every I'm sure every hobby shop owner is is having these kind of like conversations right now. Definitely, mm-hmm. I get that sense. Um, it, it's also happening in card games. Yeah, it's also happening like yep. like there's a big thing right now with Magic and getting boxes. Like, isn't there a big struggle right now for distributors to actually get the Magic to the people on time? There's there's from what I can understand, there's no real like issues with releases in terms of getting product, but there's more of an issue of, <laughs> of, uh, of being able to sell it once it gets to your store <laughs> because of overprinting and oh, uh, really? okay. they've been doing like direct sales on Amazon. 
oh. and product dumping and stuff like that. Sure. So, so you know, uh, Games Workshop looks like a pretty great company when you actually put them up against a company like uh, Hasbro, Wizards Wizard of the Coast. Coast. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as much as like, you know, there's been some negative talk in this podcast, I don't want to get anybody wrong. Like, I'm still, I love Games Workshop. I don't think it's you know, negative talk. I think it's no, just no, talking yeah, about your situation. Yeah. And, right? and, and like, I don't want to come across as a downer or anything. Yeah, it's yeah. just, I think, I think um, for the first time, um, my relationship as a business owner with Games Workshop, I feel a lot less certain of where, mm. of where, where and what is happening in front of me. And patterns that we were very used to for yeah. a very long time are becoming less constant. Yes. Like patterns yeah. of like how and when things come out or what comes out or things changing are becoming a lot less consistent and predictable. And you kind of built your business on having a plan. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you like to, you like to. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and this is why I wanted to sit down and talk to you. Yeah. This is why I want to make a video about this. Cause I think that this is the important thing for people who are your customers to hear, True. right? Like it, at the end of the day, like you, you can eat your ice cream, but it comes from somewhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it goes through a lot of hands on the way to you. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of seeing the implications of, well, what is this new world of like shipping and logistics and how stuff's warehoused and how it's delivered? Like we're it's, and it's, and it feels weird because I can go on my phone right now and have like cat is super into these, like sort of quasi manga, young adult, young mm -hmm. teen books. And a new one came out in September and I pre-ordered it on Amazon um, and the pre-order didn't was like waiting to ship because it was a pre-order, but the day it released, I could have it prime delivered that day. So I had to wait for my pre-order if I pre-ordered it from one place, or I could just go on Amazon, get it 25% cheaper and have it that afternoon. Yeah. And it's like, as a consumer, think about the cognitive dissonance that creates between your expectations on mm -hmm. some things and the reality of what more like almost like um, uh, boutique products and games workshop is still a boutique product. Yep. Like, let's not, let's not kid ourselves. Like yep. it is not eggs and milk. Nope. Like it's nope. not shipped nope. that way. Yep. It has to come. It has to fight for space on container ships. It has to fight for, you know, it's printing material to get someplace. Like they might make a lot of money, but they're not, cars you know what i mean right. they're not they're not automotive parts like yeah. they're they're going to be back of the bus to all of that stuff mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. um but it still costs a premium price and if i can get a book shipped to me overnight for my kid because i want it why can't i have this box of the thing that you sold five minutes ago that's now out of stock we don't know when it's going to come back in yeah like as a consumer it feels weird yes yeah yeah because the expectations are one way or another it, it do you think it's the vampire of commerce like do you think it's it's the Amazons of the world that have like, like what's what's that impact on you? Because like you have these mercenary customers, you can buy Games Workshop stuff on Amazon right now. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that's always been a consideration from day one. Uh, is we knew we were never going to compete for that. Like, I kind of put customers into categories, and I think like pe people that are only concerned about the best price, we're never going to shop with us in the first place, right? So. So people that come to our store have to care about the other things. Experiences. Like the yeah. experience they get, the people that work there, um, the play space, the painting space, like all the parts of the community right together. Did oh. you teach people how to use airbrushes and you fix well, them, you, clean sure. them for them? Like that's, I, I mean, that's a huge ask. Yeah. Could I, you imagine if I took my iPhone back to the Apple store and was like, hey, I don't like the screen kind of half came off this. Can you help me with that? And they'd be like, here's your number. Yes, number and how much <laughs> and, it's going to cost. And it'll be $20 yeah. for us yeah. just to look at the That's phone. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, there, there's always the, 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 the road you go down where you just charge for every little thing, right? But um, that's not the kind of business I wanted to own. Sure, you know? yeah, so yeah. There's always that kind of uh, going on in the back of your mind. But um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know I don't know. We're getting into world economics now. Exactly. Yeah, it's, that's, a little, it's a little. That's big, where we yeah. have to pump the brakes, guys, yeah. and be done this one. Well, look, man. Um, you and Jay are two of my favorite people in the world. I hope you have all the success. Um, I hope you ride out whatever this weird un uncertainty is, and uh, you know that there's some kind of like new pattern that emerges. Even if like you just know what it is going forward, yeah. maybe it'll be better. Yeah. I would love for I would love to know what it is myself because I have no <laughs> idea either because things just show up and like and and books get released and I'm like I don't like and and then to be fair there are companies that have patterns like mm -hmm. I love Corpus Belly exactly because they are so predictable it's yeah. like four little boxes or blisters a month yeah. and then big thing at Gen Con big thing at Adepticon 
Like they have their like nice, comfortable trajectory of their mm-hmm. business. They like the size of their business. They like the way that it exists. Like that fits me as where I'm at as a consumer right now. Mm-hmm. And maybe it doesn't fit everybody. And it probably doesn't fit the current generation of consumers who are much more looking at games like video games where it needs to be fixed right now. You can release unfinished things and patch it later on. Like maybe that's just where it's going and maybe I'm getting left behind and maybe that's okay. Mm -hmm. But I want, I want you to have, I want you to have a a thing that you can then put in front of people and sell. That's part of that experience. Cause I think your store is great. So if you're ever in Oakville, go check out Lords of War. It's cool as hell. Get your airbrush fix there. That's right. Get an airbrush (laughs) lesson. Sit and paint your. You have like that cool painting space too that Kevin made you. Yeah, we had a friend uh, build like a custom like uh, uh, like paint station that's like an eight feet by four it looks, wide. It's it, got beautiful lighting. It looks like a first class set of cabins on a like an expensive like Air Emirates airplane. Yes. Yeah, everything has its own little like dashboard light like across from the top. You have your own little cubby. I use the I use like too. airliner concept where yeah. like you know you're putting your baggage overhead. Or yeah. Whatever. So like when you're sitting yeah. on a hobby, you can put your stuff over over, over you. So it literally looks yeah. like a like a like a you know the two thousand dollar upgrade on like a ten eight hour <laughs> flight going into Dubai or something like that. It's awesome. It's it's us putting money into our our you know what we want our shop to be right. Like it's just that like. We want, we want people to like really enjoy being being there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we used to give them McDonald's yeah. McDonald's four tops and uh, and and red K cups to put their water in when we taught them how to paint back in the day. This is a much a yeah. much higher quality <laughs> uh, painting experience. Well, we did have sure. folding tables for a really long time, so <laughs> we we earned it. Those, you know? <laughs> those, those red Dirt. McDonald's four uh, tops were my favorite. Where you get the waffle butt? I mean, people people had to like squeeze into them because they didn't move because it was a fixed chair. Those were the shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, good luck. And thanks for watching, guys. Bye, everybody. Take care.